Hello and welcome to the For We Are Many podcast. Today we are going to be reading from Eldridge Cleaver's book, Soul on Ice. Uh, so we're continuing with the Thursday streams pertaining to the Black Panther Party. Um, we do have a PDF version of the book, but it's literally scanned on a scanner. Um, it, it, it's not a great format. I recommend getting a paper copy if you can afford it. Uh, but that being said, the link is in the description. Um, where we will be picking up today is going to be on page 18 of the PDF, which is 20, I think, 21, something like that, of um, the paper book, because there's a whole lot of preface and introduction and yada, yada, yada. Uh, anyway, my name is Rob, and that's Trisha. And uh, we're here to continue learning about what kind of environment the Black Panther Party came from, uh, what they were hoping to achieve, etc. Um, Eldridge Cleaver actually wrote this book prior to um, his involvement with the Black Panther Party. Um, it's largely a collection of letters. Uh, from when he was in Folsom Prison in 1965 and 66. Obviously, it was after his release that he um, joined up with Huey Newton uh, and Bobby Seale to be a part of the Black Panther Party. I see now that Trisha popped out into the ether again. All right. Um, anyway, chapter one is called On Becoming. Um, this was a letter written uh, while he was serving time in Folsom Prison, June 25th, 1965. Um, it starts, 1954, when I was 18 years old, um, is held to be a crucial turning point in the history of the African-American for the USA as a whole. The year segregation was outlawed by the US Supreme Court. It was also a crucial year for me because on June 18th, 1954, I began serving a sentence in state prison for possession of marijuana. The Supreme Court decision was only one month old when I entered prison and I do not believe that I even had the vaguest idea of its importance or historical significance. But later, the acrimonious controversy ignited by the end of the separate but equal doctrine was to have a profound effect on me. This controversy awakened me to my position in America, and I began to form a concept of what it meant to be black and white America. Of course, I'd always known that I was black, but I'd never really stopped to take stock of what I was involved in. I met life as an individual and took my chances. Prior to 1954, we lived in an atmosphere of Novocaine. Negroes found it necessary, in order to maintain whatever sanity they could, to remain somewhat aloof and detached from, quote, the problem. We accepted uh, indignities and the mechanics of the apparatus of oppression without reacting by sitting in or holding mass demonstrations. Nurtured by the fires of the controversy over segregation, I was soon aflame with in indignation um, over my newly discovered social status, and I inwardly turned away from America with horror, disgust, and outrage. In Soledad State Prison, I fell in with a group of young Blacks who, like myself, were in uh, vociferous rebellion against what we perceived as a continuation of slavery on a, on a higher plane. Uh, I just want to interject here to say it was uh, literally the constitutional amendment that bar that banned slavery also legalized it. And he was sitting in the means of making that happen when he wrote this letter. Precisely. Prison labor. 
at slavery. I don't, I don't care if they try to say, oh, but it's not because we paid them a few pennies for the day. That's slavery. Right. Right. Oh, but it's not because they have, you know, three hots and a cot. Okay, but it is. Right. There was three hots and a cot. Well, I don't know about three, but, you know. You got I don't know about hots. <laughs> shelter, right. Might not have been hot, but you got fed and sheltered, you know back in the days of legalized full-on ownership of other people in slavery, too. So, you know, it's really no different. Right. You're, you're locked up somewhere that you don't have the option to leave and you don't have the option to say no to being forced labor. Right. Um, back to the text. We cursed everything American, including baseball and hot dogs. All respect we may have had for politicians, preachers, lawyers, governors, presidents, senators, congressmen was utterly destroyed as we watched them temporizing and compromising over right and wrong, over legality and illegality, over constitutionality and unconstitutionality. We knew that in the end, what they were clashing over was us, what to do with the blacks and whether or not to start treating us as human, human beings. I despised all of them. Um, I just, <laughs> I'm gonna interject again. Uh, but this this portion of this paragraph really speaks volumes to how little has changed. And, and I wanna reiterate, quote, all respect we may have had for politicians, preachers, lawyers, governors, presidents, senators, congressmen was utterly destroyed as we watched them temporizing and compromising over right and wrong legality and illegality over constitutionality and unconstitutionality. We still see that today. They don't get anything done because they're too busy arguing about those exact same things. It's almost like it's on purpose. Yeah. Seems pretty fucking intentional to me. To right. stagnate, hold back anything from being fixed and be like, well, we don't know how. Yeah, you do. Right. It just and doesn't benefit wallet right and i think that a lot of the things that he's saying in the first few paragraphs of this book uh you know are are huge driving factors in why he was drawn to the black panther party right um i also found out in doing lead-up research to this that eldridge cleaver publicly supported ronald reagan in the 80s and i am so confused as to how the Minister of Information in the Black Panther Party was duped by Ronnie fucking Reagan. I don't know. That just... After after Ronald Reagan was the one that passed gun control laws to get the guns out of the hands of the Black Panther Party. Anyway, um... <laughs> I obviously am really in no place to like criticize his, his choice in that, um, being that I don't understand the struggle of being a black American in white America. But it seems to me as if that's like turning his back on everything that he fought for with the Panther Party. At least a few fundamental things. I mean, for one, Reagan was capitalist as fuck, besides the whole gun control gun control issue. Um, he was cracking down on our comrades in what was the USSR at that point in time. Literally fucking destroyed the Soviet bloc. I don't know that you should give all the credit to uh, Reagan on that, but he certainly well, had his hands in it. Even, Even though he his was, cohorts, yeah, right, was a huge, huge influence there in breaking apart Soviet bloc. Was he alone? No, but he was a huge fucking influence there. Yeah, and even though he wasn't in power anymore when the Soviet bloc fell, he was definitely a huge influence to it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anyway, we're getting a little off topic. Anyway. <laughs> Um, back to the text. The segregationists were condemned out of hand. 
without even listening to their lofty, finely woven arguments. The others I despise for wasting time in debates with the segregationists. Why not just crush them, put them in prison? They were defying the law, weren't they? I defied the law and they put me in prison. So why not put all those dirty mothers in prison too? I had gotten caught with a shopping bag full of marijuana, a shopping bag full of love. I was in love with the weed and I did not for one minute think that anything was wrong with getting high. I had been getting high for four or five years and was convinced with the zeal of a crusader that marijuana was superior to lush. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that lush obviously would be referring to alcohol. Yet the rulers of the land seem to all to be lushes. I could not see how they were more justified in drinking than I was in blowing the gauge. Blowing the gauge? I've never heard that one. Huh. Wasn't this written in 64 or 65? <laughs> well, this letter was written in 65, yes. Yes, okay. you're right. Um, I was a grasshopper. I have heard that one. And it was Me? natural that I felt myself to be unjustly imprisoned. While all this Absolutely. was... Right. Right. I mean, reading this now in an era when you basically go to a place that operates like the goddamn Apple store to buy your weed. And I didn't even realize that until this past year. I had never been in an Apple store. I don't use Apple products. Um, like I said, I had never been in an Apple store. And when I went in there, I was just like, holy shit, like all those memes are right. This literally is like a dispensary. <laughs> Damn. But, <clears throat> anyway. I've never been in one either, but, you know, I'll take their word for it. I've been in dispensaries. Those are great. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, imagine that you're buying a cell phone or a laptop or whatever instead of weed, and it's the same fucking thing. <clears throat> <laughs> Damn. Man, that's one of the things that angers me, of, you know, so many people having been forced to go to prison for weed, man. For weed. Yeah. It hurts nobody. <sighs> but anyway. Back, back to, to the, the text. text. <laughs> <laughs> While all this was going on, our group was espousing atheism. Unsophisticated and not based on any philosophical rationale, our atheism was pragmatic. I had come to believe that there is no God. If there is, men do not, don't, do not know anything about it. I would totally agree with him there. Right. Therefore, all religions were phony, which, made all, uh, which made all preachers and priests in our eyes fakers, including the ones scurrying around the prison who curiously could put in a good word for you with the almighty creator of the universe, but could not get anything down with the warden or parole board. They could usher you through the pearly gates after you were dead, but not through the prison gate while you were still alive and kicking. Yes. <laughs> right? Oh my <laughs> god, dude. He's hitting the nail on the head in every fucking sentence here. It's kind of great. Right? I'm loving it. If you can't tell from the smile on my face over here. <laughs> right? Well, and I mean, it's... It, I, I also enjoy um, um, his kind of almost sarcasm right he's ve he's basically being very very snarky yes and i like it <laughs> his snark is beautiful same About um that. Ju just ba that. just basing this on sense of humor alone i i can completely understand um why eldridge and uh and Bobby got along so well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome spot. I get it too. Oh, oh there um, it is. Uh, besides Men of the Cloth. Yep. Besides, Men of the Cloth who work in prison have an in, in ineradicable, ineradicable stigma attached to them in the eyes of convicts because they escort condemned men into the gas chamber. Such men of God are powerful yep. arguments in favor of atheism. Our atheism was a source of enormous pride to me. 
Later on, I bolstered our arguments by reading Thomas Paine. There's uh, one of the founding fathers who I'll, I will give credit as being revolutionary in his time. Um, and, it's, and it's funny that his radicalized journey starts with Thomas Paine. Um, anyway, and his devastating critique of Christianity in particular and organized religion in general. Um, actually, that's what I enjoy about Thomas Paine, it, not necessarily just his critique of Christianity and organized religion, but his critique of the power structure at the time. Um, by today's standards, he would have been a liberal revolutionary, but he was pretty forward thinking for the 18th century, in my opinion. Um, especially since, unlike most of the founding fathers, he actually grew after the revolution, and most of them did not. Right. Um, back to the text. Through reading, I was amazed to discover how confused people were. I had thought that out there beyond the, the horizon of my own ignorance, uh, unanimity existed, that even though I... Sorry, I'm waiting on the next page. That even though I myself didn't know what was happening in the universe other people certainly did yet here i was discovering that the whole usa was in a chaos of disagreement over segregation slash integration in these circumstances i decided that the only safe thing for me to do was go for myself it became clear that it was possible for me to take the initiative instead of simply reacting i could act I could unilaterally, whether anyone agreed with me or not, repudiate all allegiances, morals, values, even while continuing to exist within this society. My mind would be free and no power in the universe could force me to accept something if I didn't want to. But I would take my own sweet time. That too was a part of my new freedom. I would accept nothing until it was proven that it was good for me. I became an extreme iconoclast. Any affirmative assertion made by anyone around me became a target for tirades of criticism and denunciation. This little game got good to me and I got good at it. I attacked all forms of piety, loyalty, and sentiment. Marriage, love, God, patriotism, the constitution, the founding fathers, law, concepts of right and wrong, good and evil, all forms of ritualized and conventional behavior. As I pranced about, club in hand, seeking new idols to smash, I encountered really, for the first time in my life, with any seriousness, the ogre, rising up before me in a mist. I discovered with alarm that the ogre uh, possessed a tremendous and dreadful power over me, and I didn't understand this power, or why I was at its mercy. I tried to repudiate the ogre, uh, rooted out of my heart as I had done God, constitution, principles, mor uh, morals, and values, but the ogre had its claws buried in the core of my being and refused to let go. I fought frantically to be free, but the ogre only mocked me and sank its claws deeper into my soul. I knew then that I had found an important key, that if I conquered the ogre and broke its power over me, I would be free. But I also knew that it was a race against time and that if I did not win, I would certainly be broken and destroyed. I. A black man confronted the ogre, a white woman. Uh, do you want to take over? Oh, you're not there. Oh, right. oh you are there. Sorry. Yeah, give me just a second <laughs> to get my dog out of my seat now. <laughs> Fair enough. Hi, Sarah. It's good. It's good. Of course, she's going to take her time and stretch if she gets up. I have to turn the AC down because it's getting too cold in here. She's just like, I'm going to steal your seat. Huh. If she's not being a butt nugget, she's being a seat warmer. Okay. Hey! Check us out. We're at the same table now. Sup, Rob? Hell oh, yeah! I'm sorry. That was, that was a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little extra. That's okay. 
God, I look sunburned. Holy shit, maybe I am a little bit. Is this paused or no? No. <laughs> right on. Okay. Um, where did you leap off at there? Um, it's page 25 of the book, which is page 20 of the PDF. Uh, the second paragraph, in prison. Okay. I wasn't sure if you got through both of those big paragraphs or not. Um, okay. Do you want me to pick up there? Yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. Okay. In prison, these things withheld from and denied the prisoner uh, became precisely what he wants most of all, of course. Because we were locked up in our cells before darkness fell, I used to lie awake at night, wracked by a painful craving to take a leisurely stroll under the stars, or go to the beach, to drive a car on a freeway, to grow a beard, or to make love to a woman. Since I was not married, conjugal visits would not have solved my problem. I therefore denounced the idea of conjugal visits as inherently unfair. Single prisoners needed and deserved action just as much as married prisoners did. I advocated establishing a system under civil service whereby salaried women would minister to the needs of those prisoners who maintained a record of good behavior. Time out. If a married prisoner Time out. I think that what Eldridge is trying to say here is that sex work is work. Yes, precisely. Legitimate work. No Eldridge. Ahead of his time there. Um, where did that go? Oh, if a married prisoner preferred his own wife, that would be his right. Since California was not about to inaugurate either conjugal visits or the civil service, one could advocate with equal enthusiasm and with the same result. Nothing. This may appear ridiculous to some people, but it was very real to me and as urgent as the need to breathe because I was in my bull stage and lack of access to females was absolutely a form of torture. I suffered. My mistress at the time, sorry, give me a moment for this page to load. <laughs> at the time of my arrest, the beautiful and lonely wife of stationed overseas died unexpectedly three weeks after I entered prison and the rigid dehumanized rules governing correspondence between prisoners and free people prevented me from corresponding with other young ladies who knew. It left me without any contact with females except for those in my family. In the process of enduring my confinement I decided to get myself a pinup girl to paste on the wall of my cell. I would fall in love with her, lavish my affections upon her. She, a symbolic representative of the forbidden tribe of women, would sustain me until I was free. Out of the center of Esquire, I married a voluptuous bride. Our marriage went along swell for a time. No quarrel, no complaints. And then one evening when I went from school, shocked and rage to find that the guard had entered my cell, ripped my sugar from the wall, torn her into little pieces and left the piece floating in the coat. It was like seeing a dead body. Okay, I disappeared into the ether again for a moment. Sorry about that. Um, where were we? Giving her a proper burial, I flushed the commode. As the saying goes, I sent her to Long Beach, but I was genuinely beside myself with anger. Almost every cell except those the homosexuals had a pinup girl on the wall and the guards didn't bother them. Why, I asked guard the next day, had he seen for special treatment? Don't you know we have a rule against pasting our pictures on the wall, he asked me. Later for the rules, I said, you know as well as I do that that rule is not enforced.
I see that uh, Trisha blooped out into the ether. Um, I stepped away for a moment, so I don't actually know where it left off. So hold on a second. All right, <clears throat> I am back. Um, sorry if there's a little overlap here, but um, back to the text. Tell you what, he said, smiling at me. The smile put me on my guard. I'll compromise with you. Get yourself a colored girl for a pinup, no white women, and uh, I'll let it stay up. Is that a deal? I was more embarrassed than shocked. He was laughing in my face. I called him two or three dirty names and walked away. I can still recall his big moon face grinning at me over yellow teeth. The disturbing part about this whole incident was that a terrible feeling of guilt came over me as I realized that I had chosen the picture of the white girl over the available pictures of black girls. I tried to rationalize it away, but uh, I was fascinated by the truth involved. Why hadn't I thought about it in this light before? So I took hold of the question and began to uh, inquire into my feelings. Was it true? Did I really prefer white girls over black? The conclusion was clear and inescapable. I did. I decided to check out my friends uh, on this point and it was easy to determine from listening to their general conversation that the white woman occupied a peculiarly uh, prominent place in all of our frames of reference. With what, I've, with what I have learned since then, this all seems terribly elementary now, but at the time it was a tremendously intriguing adventure of discovery. One afternoon when a large group of Negroes was on the prison yard shooting the breeze, that's a phrase you don't hear too much anymore. Um, I grabbed the floor and posed the question, which did they prefer, white women or black? Some said Japanese, others said Chinese, some said European women, others said Mexican women. They all stated a preference and they generally freely admitted their dislike for black women. I don't want nothing black but a Cadillac, said one. If money was black, I wouldn't want none of it, put in another. Wow, that's like some internalized self-hate kind of well not not even kind of it is <coughs> a short little stud who is a very good lightweight boxer with a little man's complex that made him love to box heavyweights jumped to, uh, jumped up to his feet he had a yellowish complexion and we called him butterfly all you expletive are sick I don't like no stinking white woman. My grandma is a white woman and I don't even like her. But it just so happened that Butterfly's crime partner was in the crowd and after Butterfly had his say, his crime partner said, oh, sit on down and quit that lying little old chump. What about that gray girl in San Jose who you had, uh, who had your nose wide open? Did you like her or were you just running after her with your tongue hanging out because, or hanging out of your head because you hated her? <coughs> Um, partly because he was embarrassed and partly because his crime partner was a heavyweight, Butterfly flew into him. And before we could separate them and disperse so the guards wouldn't know who had been fighting, Butterfly bloodied his crime partner's nose. Butterfly got away, but because of the blood, his partner got caught. I ate dinner with Butterfly that evening and questioned him sharply about his attitude towards white women. And after an initial evasiveness, he admitted that white women bugged him too. It's a sickness, he said. All our lives, we've had the white woman dangled before our eyes like a carrot on a stick before a donkey. Look, but don't touch. In 1958, after I had gone out on parole and was returned to San Quentin as a parole violator with a new charge, Butterfly was still there. He had become a black Muslim and was chiefly responsible for teaching me the black Muslim philosophy. Upon his release from San Quentin, Butterfly joined the Los Angeles Mosque uh, advanced rapidly through the ranks and is now a full-fledged minister um, of one of Elijah Muhammad's mosques in another city. 
He successfully completed his parole, got married to a very black girl, and is doing fine. They had to specify a very, excuse me, a very black girl. From our discussion, which began that evening and has never yet ended, we went on to notice how thoroughly, as a matter of course, a black growing up in America is indoctrinated with the white racist standard of beauty. Not that the whites made a conscious, calculated effort to do this, we thought, but since they constituted the majority, uh, the whites brainwashed the blacks by the very processes the whites employed to indoctrinate themselves with their own group standards. It intensified my frustrations to know that I was indoctrinated to see the white woman is more beautiful and more desirable than my own black woman. It drove me into books seeking light on the subject. In Richard Wright's Native Son, I found uh, Bigger Thomas and a keen insight into the problem. My interest in this area persisted undiminished, and then in 1955, an event took place in Mississippi which turned me inside out. Emmett Till, a young Negro down from Chicago on a visit, was murdered allegedly for flirting with a white woman. He had been shot, his head crushed from repeated blows with a blunt in instrument, and his badly decomposed body was recovered from the river with a heavy weight on it. I was, of course, angry over the whole bit, but one day I saw it in a magazine, a picture of the white woman with, uh, with who Emmett Till was said to have flirted. While looking at the picture, I felt that little tension in the, in the center of my chest I experienced when a woman appeals to me. I was disgusted and angry with myself. Here is a woman who had caused the death of a black, possibly, be, possibly because when he looked at her, he also felt the same tensions of lust and desire in his chest, and probably for the same general reasons that I felt that. It was all unacceptable to me. I looked at the picture again and again, and in spite of everything, and against my will and the hate I felt for the woman, and all that she represented, she appealed to me. I flew into a rage at myself, at America, at white women, at the history that had placed those tensions of lust and desire on, uh, in my chest. <clears throat> Two days later, I had a nervous breakdown. For several days, I ranted and raved against the white race, against white women in particular, against white America in general. When I came to myself, I was locked in a padded cell with not even the vaguest memory of how I got there. All I could recall was an eternity of pacing back and forth in the cell, preaching to the unhearing walls. I had several sessions with a psychiatrist. His conclusion was that I hated my mother. How he arrived at this conclusion, I'll never know, because he knew nothing about my mother. And when he'd ask me questions, I would answer him with absurd lies. What revolted me about him was that he had heard me denouncing the whites. Yet each time he interviewed me, he deliberately guided the conversation back to my family life, to my childhood. That in itself was all right, but he deliberately blocked all my attempts to bring out the racial question, and he made it clear that he was not interested in my attitude towards whites. This was a Pandora's box he did not care to open. After I seized my diatribes against the whites, I was uh, let out of the hospital back into the general inmate population, just as if nothing had ever happened. I continued to brood over these events and over the dynamics of race relations in America. During this period, I was concentrating my reading in the field of economics, um, having previously dabbled in the theories and writings of Rousseau, Thomas Paine, and Voltaire. I had added a little polish to my uh, iconoclastic stance without, however, bothering too much to understand their affirmative positions in economics because everybody seemed to find it necessary to attack and condemn Karl Marx in their writings, I sought out his books and although he kept me with a headache, I took him for my authority. I was not prepared to understand him, but I was able to see him in a thoroughgoing critique and condemnation of capitalism. It was like taking medicine for me to find that indeed, American capitalism deserved all the hatred and contempt that I felt for it in my heart. This had a positive stabilizing effect on me to an extent because I was not about to become stable and it diverted me from my previous occupation, morbid broodings on the black man and the white woman. Pursuing my readings into the history of socialism, I read, or I read rather, with very little understanding some of the passionate uh, 
exorbitory writings of Lenin, and I fell in love with Bakunin and Nechayev's Catechism of the Revolutionist, the principles of which, along with some of Machiavelli's advice, I sought to incorporate into my own behavior. I took the catechism, sorry, for my Bible, uh, and standing on a one-man platform that had nothing to do with the reconstruction of society, I began consciously incorporating these principles into my daily life to employ tactics of ruthlessness in my dealings with everyone with whom I came into contact. And I began to look at white America through these new eyes. Um, I want to apologize when I'm like struggling to see something. It's because this PDF is not great. <laughs> I have it zoomed in, but you know, it's just blurry enough that if there's italics on it, like there is for, for titles, then I'm like, what the fuck does that say? All squinty and shit. And um, I'm seeing a little bit of, I mean, obviously we haven't necessarily read the same works or, or come from the same life experience, but um, reading Marx is, has been, to say the least, an adventure for me as well. Um, but ultimately I see Marxism and Marxism-Leninism and even anarchism as lenses to see society through. And he began to look at white America through these new eyes. And I totally understand what that feels like. I can't imagine exactly what that feels like given that I never came from that background, but I do understand what it's like to, to see the world through a completely different angle and how awakening that can be. Oh, uh, Trisha made it back into the waiting room. Um, any minute now. Are you there? Hi, I'm back. Hell yeah. yeah. Right on. So uh, yeah, I, I can hear you now. So that's that's a plus. Awesome. Good shit. Kitty. I am on the bottom right. right hand side of page 23 in the PDF, if you're uh, wondering. I'm about to turn the page. Watch actually. the book number now because I can't even see. Oh, you're. Well, never mind. I just saw it. I'm about yeah, to. Quick. I'm about to be on page 32 of the of the paper numbers, but that's going to be page 24 of the PDF. Okay. Um, somehow I arrived at the conclusion that as a matter of principle, it was of paramount importance for me to have an antagonistic, ruthless attitude towards white women. The term... Page flip. The term outlaw appealed to me at the time of my parole date, or, and, and at the time my parole date was drawing near, I considered myself to be mentally free. I was a, a quote-unquote, an outlaw. I had stepped outside of the white man's law, which I repudiated with scorn and self-satisfaction. I became a law unto myself, my own legislature, my own Supreme Court, my own executive. At the moment I walked out of the prison gate, my feelings towards white women in general could be summed up in the following lines. It's a poem called To a White Girl. <clears throat> I love you because you're white, not because you're charming or bright. Your whiteness is a silky thread snaking through my so my thoughts, <laughs> snaking through my thoughts 
in red hot patterns of lust and desire. I hate you because you're white. Your white meat is nightmare food. White is the skin of evil. You're my Moby Dick, white witch, symbol of the rope and hanging tree, of the burning cross, loving you thus and hating you so, my heart is torn in two, crucified. Wow. Dude, that next paragraph though, Wow. I mean, to be fair, though, I did know that there was going to be some dark aspects to this book. I didn't really expect it to be so, like, blunt and so early. Um, but I do know uh, from, again, background research into this that um, earlier in his life, he was a convicted rapist and he completely changed his thinking uh, coming out of prison the final time. So, I mean, I, I guess, like, it, I guess, like, we're seeing where his mindset was at the time, which, I mean, later on, I mean, he denounced who he had been, so, I mean, at least he was able to come to terms with it, but I don't even, I don't even know what to say about this. I don't either. Um, yeah, back to the text. I became a rapist. To refine my technique and modus operandi, uh, I started out by practicing on black girls in the ghetto. In the black ghetto, where dark and vicious deeds appear not as aberrations or deviations from the norm, but as part of the sufficiency of the evil of a day. When I considered myself smooth enough, I crossed the tracks and sought out white prey. I did this consciously, deliberately, willfully, methodically. Uh, though looking back, I see that I was in a frantic, wild, and completely abandoned frame of mind. Rape was an insurrectionary act. It delighted me that I was defying and trampling upon the white man's law, upon his system of values, and that I was defiling his women. And this point, I believe, was the most satisfying to me because I was very resentful over the historical fact of how the white man has used the black woman. I felt I was getting revenge from the sight of the act of rape. Uh, consternation spread outwardly in concentric circles. I wanted to send waves of consternation throughout the white race. Recently, I came upon a, a quotation from one of Leroy Jones' poems taken from his book, The Dead Lecturer. <clears throat> A cult of death, need of the simple striking arm under the street lamp. The cutters from under the rented earth come up, black dada nihilismus, rape the white girls, rape their fathers, cut the mother's throats. Wow. Uh, fuck. I have lived those lines, and I know that if I had not been apprehended, I would have slit some white throats. There are, of course, many young blacks out there right now who are slitting white throats and raping the white girl. They are not doing this because they read Leroy Jones' poetry, as some of his critics seem to believe. Rather, Leroy is expressing the funky facts of life. After I returned to prison, I took a long look at myself and, for the first time in my life, admitted that I was wrong that I had gone astray, astray not so much from the white man's laws, from being human, from being civilized, for I could not approve the act of rape. Even though I had some insight into my own motivations, I did not feel justified. I lost my self-respect. My pride as a man dissolved and my whole fragile moral structure seemed to collapse, completely shattered. That is why I started to write. Right. That is why I started to write to save myself. I realized that no one could save me but myself. The prison authorities were both uninterested and unable to help me. I had to seek out the truth and unravel the snarled web of my motivations. I had to find out who I am and what I want to be, what type of man I should be, and what I could do to become the best of which I was capable. I understood that what had happened to me had also happened to countless other blacks and it would happen to many, many more. 
I learned that I had been taking the easy way out, running away from problems. I also learned that it, easy, it is easier to do evil than it is to do good. And I have been terribly impressed by the youth of America, black and white. I am proud of them because they have reaffirmed my faith in humanity. I have come to feel what must be love for the young people of America. And I want to be part of the good and greatness that they want for all people. From my prison cell, I've watched America slowly coming awake. It is not fully awake yet, but there is soul in the air and everywhere I see beauty. I have watched the sit-ins, the freedom raids, the Mississippi blood summers, demonstrations all over the country, the FSM movement, the teach-ins, and the mounting protest over Lyndon Strangle Love's foreign policy. All of this, the thousands of little details, show me it is time to straighten up and fly right. That is why I decided to concentrate on my writings and efforts in this area. <clears throat> we are a very sick country. I perhaps am sicker than most, but I accept that. I told you in the beginning that I'm extremist by nature, so it is only right that I should be extremely sick. I feel like that's that's kind of working out some internalized self-hate, and there seems to be a lot of that in this particular letter. Um, There's also the context as to why. Right, that's the thing. Um, the best one can possibly fucking do, the best move one can possibly fucking take after having taken those actions. Yeah, hate yourself. Well, I mean, if if I can realize how you're being to other people, because fuck that, the whole attitude of, oh, they're women. No, we're our own women. We're not anybody else's fucking women, regardless of their skin color or shape of genitalia. And yeah, but I also think that the internalized self hate started well before that. Well, probably, but I'm just saying, at least at this point, it was fucking well-deserved. Yeah. Yeah, I'll totally agree with that. Um. The only way that a person can actually fucking change their own perspective after being that type of fucking person towards others is to realize how absolutely abhorrently fucking wrong they were, because it's at that point that they actually you know, see the option of, I need to change myself. Until you admit that you're fucking wrong and fucked up for doing those things, you ain't gonna change. Right. Right. Well said. Um, but I, I don't necessarily, I, I see why he saw himself as sick, but um, I, I don't think that being an extremist makes it natural that you're sick i i don't think uh I, I don't think that i can agree with that sentiment but um that being said this is also before the panther party was even formed um i think he is just making a point there that he's an extremist in every way and so of course the extremism would re would also correlate to how sick he is fair from the sounds of that last part but so uh the start of this next paragraph i think sums up a lot though uh i was very familiar with the eldridge who came to prison but that eldridge no longer exists and the one i am now is in some ways a stranger to me you may find this difficult to understand but it it is very easy for uh for one in prison, sorry, to lose his sense of self. And if he has been undergoing all kinds of extreme involved and unregulated changes, then he ends up not knowing who he is. Take the point of being attractive to women. You can easily see how a man can lose his arrogance or certainty on that point while in prison. When he's in the free world, he gets constant feedback on how he looks from the number of female heads he turns when he walks down the street. In prison, he gets only hate stares and sour frowns. Years and years of bitter looks. Individuality is not nourished in prison, neither by the officials nor by the convicts. It is a deep hole out of which to climb. So I, I think that that had a lot to do with shaping who he wanted to become. Right. Um, Definitely had an impact. 
But I, I just want to reread that first two lines. I was very familiar with the Eldridge who came to prison, but that Eldridge no longer exists. And the one I am now is in some ways a stranger to me. That's called growth. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be so frightened yes. of change. And honestly, for the dark hole that he was climbing out of, I have to give him credit. Um, you know, he didn't let it lose him, uh, his sense of self. He had to redefine who he was. And had he not done that, he would not have ended up becoming the person that he was. True. He was willing to look at his faults, you know, straight on and fix himself. And there's a lot of people that, I mean, I've known in my real world environment, I guess, that aren't able to do that in much less challenging situations. So I think it does show a certain fortitude. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay. It was really quiet and I wanted to make sure you didn't bloop out into the ether again. <laughs> no, still here. Um, what must be done, I believe, is that all these problems, particularly the sickness between the white woman and the black man, must be brought out into the open dealt with and page flip uh, dealt with and resolved I know that the black man's sick attitude toward the white woman is a revolutionary sickness it keeps him perpetually out of harmony with the system that is oppressing him many whites flatter themselves with the idea that the negro male's lust and desire for the white dream girl is um, purely an aesthetic attraction, but nothing could be farther from the truth. His motivation is often uh, of such a bloody, hateful, bitter, and malignant nature that whites would really be hard pressed to find it flattering. I have discussed these points with prisoners who were convicted of rape and their motivations are very plain, but they are very reluctant to discuss these things with white men who by and large make up the prison staffs. I believe that in the experience of these men lies the knowledge and wisdom that must be utilized to help other youngsters who are heading in that same direction. I think all of us, the entire nation, will be better off if we bring it all out front. In other words, let's not try to hide um, the ugly parts of our society. Let's confront them so we can fix them. And I think that's an important... Um, um, Step. I, I think that's probably a, a, an important factor in him being involved in the Panther Party because they were looking at their society, at the ugly sides of their society and figuring out how do we tackle this. And they were doing what has actually been found in a lot of indigenous tribal people that, you know, still live in that type of setting today that when somebody does something wrong, there's no manner of imprisoning them. It's not a punishment deal. It's a, you get confronted by everybody in your village and they remind you of all the good things that you've done to remind you to find the good in yourself, but they're holding it accountable, addressing you directly or accountable to your community of like really that's that's the shit you're doing when you could be doing these other good things like you've done before to get it to fucking register like we're not gonna accept that how about you remember who the fuck you are and are supposed to be right um I just read ahead and I love the uh, the last sentence in this letter, but I'll get to that in a second. It may be that I can harm myself by speaking frankly and directly, but I do not care about that at all. Of course I want to get out of prison, badly, but I shall get out someday. I am more concerned with what I am going to be after I get out. I know that by following the course which I have charted, I will find my salvation. 
If I followed the path laid down for me by the officials, I'd undoubtedly have long since been out of prison, but I'd be less of a man. I'd be weaker and less certain of where I want to go, what I want to do, and how to go about it. And this is the line I was referring to. The price of hating other human beings is loving oneself less. Yep. Because that, that's the shit that'll take your peace of mind. It takes too much fucking energy to hate someone. Amen to that. So, um, we have made it to the end of the first chapter. Um, so we decided this is probably a pretty decent place to wrap it up for a day. It's not a, it's not a terribly long piece. Um, but there was also a lot to discuss in that. Um, including the, the significant dark side of Eldridge Cleaver before he, you know, like, faced his demons, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't even really know what else to say about that. Honestly, I don't either, other than... Um at least from my perspective and reflection on this chapter, there's a lot of things that can be addressed in that manner of being held accountable to your community. Like how they were holding each other accountable when people were fucking off on party time and going and doing robberies of stores and shit like that. And they were like, wait a minute, you can't be fucking doing that. Um, okay, right. that's, that's an instance where that is enough but when it comes to rape that is not enough that will never be enough that gives no peace of mind no justice to the victims agreed agreed and uh well i mean not so much rape specifically but sexism and uh, misogyny in general were very big issues especially in the early days of the black panther party <laughs> it was something that they had to address within their own ranks of calling people out like wait a minute the sisters aren't here for that right like, right and, and bobby well, wrote pretty at length about that and about how big of a struggle that was right and that that was hard enough to you know actually just be holding a other accountable for of like they even making a pass that's unwelcome ain't fucking cool don't pull that shit here right and, and again the sisters aren't here for that they're here for fucking revolution right and well anybody who's been following us for any significant point of time knows my stance on it the only way to stop a rapist from raping again is to cut their dick off if they're going to use it as a fucking weapon then you don't deserve to be armed with that and that, outside of having a prison system, is the only way I see possible to actually fucking stop a rapist that does not look in that mirror and go, oh, fuck, I'm acting absolutely fucking heinously. I need to stop. I need to change who I am, which thankfully Eldridge was able to do. But most people who go around committing rape don't have that self-accountability. Right to look in the mirror and go wow I'm fucked up for this right and uh, I mean you know the fact that he became uh, such a prominent voice for liberation is is probably directly a result of that that self-reflection and the the quest to be better right that's the thing you have to actually make that choice you have to be able to look at where you fucked up and go i want to be a better person today than i was yesterday and set that goal every fucking day of being a better person than you were the day before i mean we've we've all been through fucked up circumstances in our lives and done things that we regret it's what you do moving forward that does have the greatest impact of are you going to correct yourself or are you going to keep you know violating the ethical rights of other human beings at least he course corrected right um 
That being said, next time uh, we will be picking up at page 37 in the paper book, which is page 26 in the uh, in the PDF that, that we're providing the link to. Um, I just wanted to kind of recap what we've had going on this week. There is some new material on our website that we ask for your help in pushing. If you are, are financially able to help um, financially, with either of these things, um, please do. We have an article up uh, with our current event stream from August 31st, which was the Hurricane Ida special, um, with a list and links of organizations um, that are on the ground that need supplies and you know need cash to continue doing what they're doing. Um, there's groups that are focused on healthcare. There's groups that are focused on search and rescue. And of course, there are groups focused on, you know, necessities, food, water, toiletries, so on and so forth. Um, the other one is basically uh, a statement of solidarity with the striking Nabisco and Mandela's international workers. Um, you know, there's some, some quotes from uh, the AFL, the Oregon uh, AFL-CIO and the union president of the actual, you know, union that's striking. Um, there's a pretty solid Twitter owned by the uh, <laughs> Railway Workers Union uh, because Mandela's, uh, they were confident enough to tell the press that they anticipated no production delays. And then the railway union, uh, the railway workers union, got involved and refused to drop off the flour and sugar that they needed to make their shit. So, uh, sorry, I can't hear you over the sound of our solidarity. <laughs> anyway, the, the the point is though is that we have. I'm sorry. What was that? That was just pretty fucking solid on their behalf to be like, yeah, no, we're just not going to deliver this shit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's it's incredible, you know, like Mandela's is literally bussing scabs over the picket line, unloading them out of sight, loading them up out of sight and bussing them out every day for every shift. And, well, they'll be uh, wasting their time when they don't have any flour or sugar. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah. <laughs> um, the striking workers specifically ask uh, that supporters boycott Mexican-made Nabisco products because, you know, all American facilities are currently on strike. Um, yeah. But... I think it's a better idea to just boycott Nabisco in general. There's right. a there's a, a company called Back to Nature. Uh, they're available at Sprouts. I'm sure they're not the only the only chain that that carries them, but um, Back to Nature makes uh, their own version of Ritz, their own version of Oreo, um, and they're actually vegan. Whereas Oreos are basically vegan, but they're also made on conveyor belts that handle animal products, so therefore they're not vegan. Um, and Ritz crackers have butter in them, whereas the Back to Nature ones don't. So they have good vegan Nabisco alternatives, is my point. Um, and I mean, like, fucking chicken and a biscuit who even likes that shit? I've found those disgusting my entire life. Same. Like, if that's what you're eating, man, like, please just find some better, <laughs> find some better snacks. Eat some fucking trail mix. For real. I just, I don't know how that would ever have sounded appealing to anybody of chicken and a biscuit. I don't want a chicken flavored cracker. That's... What's wrong with your taste buds? <laughs> Find better taste buds. Yeah, for real. Like, is this for the fuckers that eat milk toast for breakfast? Like, come on now. 
<laughs> like the thought of that kind of just made me want to throw up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so uh, we had our Hurricane Ida special current event stream on the 31st of August. Yesterday, we had our um, Detroit riots piece. Um, and then next Monday, what did I just drop? I'll look for it later. Um, next Monday, we're having part two of Emma <laughs> Goldman's Anarchism and Other Essays. Tuesday, uh, we will be foregoing our usual current event stream to talk about the future. Right? Uh, Special. We are future going, effects. We are going <laughs> to have on... Uh, well, if, if any of you are as big a Trekkies as I am, then you'll be excited for this. But we're having an episode about Star Trek. And uh, for a special guest, we're going to have the Star Trek communist on. If you're not familiar with him, um, look him up on Twitter. Most of his social media presence is on Twitter, at Boomer Niner. Um, which I'm still not sure where that comes from, but whatever. Um, the Niner part I get. It's the Boomer part that confuses me because he's not old enough to be a Boomer. <laughs> Unless he is, and he's just like fooling really, all of really us. young looking. Yeah, yeah. He looks like he's about thirty. I don't right. know. So if he's a boomer, he is aged beautifully, and I want to know his secrets. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Um, no, seriously though, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, we've we've all known for a long time, you know, that 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 Star Trek kind of has some some leftist angles on some things and that's that's literally what his focus is is on tying the star trek universe star trek canon to communism um and i'm all about it we will also be seeing back a a return guest that we haven't seen in about a month maybe a month and a half um, Something I'm, like that. I'm sure you guys remember jason um but the funny thing is is i messaged him the other day to see if he would be interested and uh he told me to call him because he was driving. And I was just like, hey man, I know we haven't talked in a while, but this is gonna sound random. Are you a are you a are you a Trekkie? And he was like, fuck yeah, I am. And I was like, well, then I know that uh, and I already know that you're a communist. So how would you feel about coming back onto the podcast to talk to the Star Trek communism or god damn it, to talk to the Star Trek communist about Star Trek and communism? And he was like, Oh fuck yeah, dude, sign me up. <laughs> So, pretty excited about that. And then uh, next Wednesday, kind of keeping along with the uh, Detroit history that we've been talking about lately, we're going to talk about Ford's Battle of the Overpass. Um, without giving too much away, striking workers, fighting police and private security, you know, the usual capitalist shit. Um... But yeah, it's uh, kind of keeping along with our, our focus on Detroit lately. And I kind of want to tie the two together uh, sometime in September as well um, by, you know, doing a piece on the, the White Panthers and the MC5. Tie together right. Detroit and the Black Panther Party, I know. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. We're back to our regular production schedule. So, uh, Mondays we have our Revolutionary Love Book Club, which currently is Anarchism and Other Essays. Uh, Tuesday we have our current event stream, with the exception of next week, is going to be, um, our Star Trek Future stream. events. <laughs> right, future events stream. Um, and then Wednesdays are still our historical pieces and Thursdays are Black Panther Day. Um, I am not sure exactly when, uh, Bread Theory is doing his, um, state and revolution pieces, but one or both of us hopefully 
uh will be on that regularly as well that was the whole point of this cross-pollination thing he's helping us out with our anarchist literature we're helping him out with his communist literature so um Hell yeah. you know try to get the whole perspective there so um again if anybody wants to be a guest or anybody uh sees anything that they want us to talk about or has anything to say about the things that we're already talking about you can hit us up on social media you can Email us uh, at for we are many podcast at gmail.com. Um, and of course, you're more than welcome to make an account on for we are many.org and contact us that way. Um, questions, concerns, criticisms, et cetera, et cetera. That's the best way to get to us. Also, if you're interested in being a writer and would like to produce a column on our page, we've got room for that. If you produce video content, like you're out, you know, covering protests that are going on, etc. We got room for that. So one of our big goals here is to amplify voices on the left. Bring them. Indeed. Um. Also, we're old and don't know how to tick the talk. So if somebody out there wants to help us, as far as running social media, you know, like we're juggling TikTok all and Instagram. Money. That's where we need yeah. help, really. We, we need help with those. We've got like the Facebook covered between us and the rest of the team, but we definitely need some help with TikTok and Instagram. Yeah. Help. Help. Anyway, um, don't know my way around that shit. I end up going down a rabbit hole every fucking time and I'll look at my phone and look at the window like, wow, it got dark outside. I just I just opened TikTok. No. <laughs> no, it's Watch been three and a half hours. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> my productivity goes right out the window with squirrels and shiny stuff because ADHD. TikTok yeah. is too, too much. TikTok is the bane of our existence. Um, so obviously we're recording this in advance, so I did not bring it up during the Detroit riots piece because it hadn't happened yet when we were recording it, but the officers and the paramedics are charged in the murder of Elijah McClain. It only took over two years for that to happen. But the officers and the paramedics are being charged in his death. You might ask, oh, why the paramedics? Because they pumped him full of ketamine and he went into cardiac arrest. Yep. Yeah. That's excessive. If you don't know how to fucking figure out proper dosage you shouldn't be you know having people's lives in their in your hands in a fucking ambulance in an emergency yeah if you don't know when to stop ketamine is something that is very effective in very fucking tiny doses for humans very well well tiny. yeah and i mean they shouldn't have fucking used it at all they used it as a sedative because supposedly he was being unruly but i mean like Granted, the, the, the body cam footage the body cam footage isn't great, but I think that it does show very clearly that he was not resisting. There's so many safer ways to sedate somebody, even if they are actually posing a threat of harm to themselves or others, which again does not appear to be the case in the video footage there but there's i mean they could have given him a small dose of valium and you know been like all right twilight time enjoy the stars not here we're gonna fucking stop your heart with excessive dosage so yeah that's medical malpractice just in another form Right. You got um, somebody's life in your hands and you pump them full of too much fucking horse tranquilizer? We you know? might do 
a short stream at some point this weekend just to kind of talk about some of the things that we that we missed in the current event stream because we were focused on Hurricane Ida. Um, I don't mean to I don't mean to take anything away from what those people are going through. Um, that's why we focus so heavily on it during this week's current event stream. But there's actually been a lot of shit going on uh, that we probably should talk about, um, such as, for example, Elijah McClain. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I can't say for certain that that will happen. Um, but if it does, we'll try to, you know, post about it before we go live. <laughs> try being the operative word there. Also, if you haven't yet, come to the For We Are Many Education and Discussion Group. Uh, we're sitting right about 900 members. We're, we're growing slowly, but we haven't had a massive troll problem like, like a lot of other groups that we're all involved with. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw right. any shade there. Um, but the, the point is... is but we've, it's true. We've, it's been a tiny sprinkling of them. We've had a few. Yeah, like, we're near as many as I would have anticipated by now. Yeah. So I, I don't exactly know how we've flown under the radar of the conservatives, but that's totally fine with me, you guys. <laughs> um, I'd rather take slower think, growth than being outnumbered by trolls. That right. Well, steady growth is good when it's word of mouth of people being like, oh, hey, I like this post. I'm going to share this. And then their friends see it who are typically mostly leftists too. I mean, to be fair, um, a lot of us cut a lot of the fucking right wingers off of our social media because of Trump's bullshit and QAnon bullshit. So that seems to be a safer way to like grassroots method, get word out of if you like what we're doing, share it to your friends, invite them to the page, you know, because that's the people we're trying to reach to actually unite the left. You know, trolls are entertaining every now and then, but mostly they become distractionary. And then I'm like, all right, mute. <laughs> they get mad. How oh, dare you mute me? <laughs> but anyway, I don't know. Rambling. Our Ram awkward sign off. Um, so once again, I want to plug this. So we'll be having the Star Trek Communist on next Tuesday, the 7th of September, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, it will be available on uh, our typical live platforms, which are Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, which is Twitter and Twitch, uh, as well as on the Left Signal Boost um, Facebook page. And, um, well, I'm going to invite him to broadcast to his platform as well. Um, I haven't had that conversation with him yet, but, um, yeah, pretty excited for it. Um, we will be pushing this flyer around very shortly. Um, and I'm just asking all you guys to help spread the word. That being Share said, that shit. Uh, until next time, uh, everybody stay safe out there. Try to limit your contact with other human beings. Wear a goddamn mask and take the fucking shot, dude. And wash your fucking hands. And wash your fucking hands. It's quite remarkable how big a difference that can make in a fucking pandemic wash your fucking hands if you go in a store hit your hands with some hand sanitizer on your fucking way out the door or as soon as you get in your car if you don't have some on your keychain or in your pocket um wash your fucking hands that cuts down the transfer of germs more than just about fucking anything when it comes to shit you're coming into contact with in public. Wear your fucking mask. Wash your fucking hands. It's so simple. So, so simple. So simple. No, anyway. Right? Um, anyway.
Uh, anyway, I guess we will, uh, you know, let you guys get back to your fucking night. Um, <laughs> you might see us over the weekend. If not, you probably have stuff to catch up on. Um, we did our current event stream, the Hurricane Ida special on Tuesday. We did the Detroit riots yesterday. We've got this. Um, and it's all available on forweirmany.org. We also did the article with the current event stream on forweirmany.org. So there's a lot more to it if you go to our website versus if you go to our Facebook. Uh, but you can also find the article at our Facebook. Um, and then uh, obviously the thing about the Nabisco strikers has uh, Solidarity Fund links in it to um, two of the unions that are on strike. So um, it's a start. Uh, if you have any any solidarity funds for like say the the railway workers union or for the other striking um, locations, please send it to us and we'll be more than happy to add it into that page. Um, other than that though, we will see you guys on Monday and uh, thank you. Have a good night. Love, peace, prosperity. We'll live long and prosper. Thank <laughs> you.